Welcome to key area four of natural fire biology unit one. Today we're going to be looking at proteins. So previously we've been looking at DNA, mRNA and protein synthesis. So how proteins are made. And hopefully you should remember that proteins are made of long chains of amino acids which are joined together at the ribosome. Today what we're going to be looking at uh, are what these proteins do, some different examples of them and the different types that you can find. So hopefully you can also remember that there is a large variety of protein shapes and functions and what this depends on is the sequence of amino acids which create that protein at the ribosome. This sequence of amino acids also depends on the sequence of DNA which comes before it. There are five main groups of proteins that you need to know. They are structural, hormones, antibodies, receptors and enzyme. An easy way to remember these five is SHARE. So S, H, A, R and E. If you write that out, you should hopefully try and remember the rest of the groups and fill in the blanks for what they are. What we're going to do, because you need to know these five different types of protein and you need to know an example of them, are in the next few slides, I'm going to go through each one. It'd be helpful if you complete this table as you went through it and listen back and try to, uh, try to fill in what you need to know for the function and example. So to start off with, structural proteins. They are used to give support to cell structures. A good example of this that we've already looked at are the proteins that you find in the cell membrane. Remember that the proteins are really useful. They're required for active transport to take place, for transport across the membrane. Hormones are chemical messengers that carry specific messages through the bloodstream. Uh, an example of this is insulin, and this is something that we'll look at later on in the course, but this signals the liver to store excess, excess glucose in the form of glycogen. Again, we'll look at that in a bit more detail later. Antibodies are proteins that defend against pathogens such as bacteria and viruses. Uh, an example of this would be immunoglobins that provide a defense against the, the flu virus or influenza viruses. For receptors, these are little proteins that allow cells to recognize specific substances. So for example, going back to the hormone of insulin, liver cells have certain receptors on them for the signal sent by insulin. Without these receptors, they would not be able to recognize what substance was coming across. And finally for E, we're looking at enzymes. So enzymes are found in all living cells, producing living cells, and they are used to speed up chemical reactions in the cell. If you didn't have enzymes speeding up these chemical reactions, then we wouldn't survive. We need these enzymes to speed up these reactions for life to be possible. An example of this is starch is broken down into maltose through the enzyme amylase in the digestive system. So enzymes, so the final of the five groups of proteins, is the one that we are going to put most attention onto. Okay, so enzymes have four principal properties. First of all, as you should already know, they're made up of protein. They're one of the groups of proteins. Secondly, as I've just said, they are sped up, uh, they speed up chemical reactions and they are produced by living cells. What's also important is that enzymes are unchanged during a chemical reaction. This means they're not disposable, they do not speed up a reaction and then they're destroyed or consumed by the process, they are unchanged by it. So we're going to look at the structure of enzymes, how they work, and some other things to do with them in terms of how they can uh, speed up things depending on the conditions. So first of all, for an enzyme to work, it must bind to a molecule called its substrate. So in this example here, the red blob with the bit missing is the enzyme, and there is only one of these three substrates that can fit. Hopefully by looking at it, you should see that the, the purple and the yellow substrates would not fit. The green one would be a perfect fit though. The substrate that an enzyme can fit with is called its specific substrate. And that's very, very important to remember this bit. An enzyme can only bind with a specific substrate. No other substrates will fit with the enzyme. They must fit for the reaction to go ahead. When this specific substrate binds to an enzyme, it binds at a part called its active site. So if you look at the diagram on the left, where that green specific substrate is binding to the enzyme, the area where it binds to is the active site. So you think of this as where the activity takes place. The active site is where the substrate and the enzyme meet. 
When the enzyme and the substrate meet and join together at the active site, they form an enzyme substrate complex. And once this reaction takes place, they then produces products. So in this example here, the two parts that are leaving the enzyme are the products of the reaction. You'll need to know this diagram and be able to label all of it as well. There are two main types of enzyme reactions that we're going to look at, and they're fairly straightforward once we break them down. The first is a degradation reaction. So if you use an enzyme to break down a large molecule into smaller molecules, this is a degradation reaction. If you think of degradation as breaking something down, you're breaking a large molecule into small molecules through an enzyme. For example, if you want to carry out this experiment on your, your own, if you take a piece of bread and you chew on it, but you don't swallow, eventually what should start happening is that the bread will start tasting a bit sweet. This is because bread contains a lot of starch, which your broad body isn't able to properly digest. However, in your saliva, you have an enzyme called amylase. This breaks down the starch into a sugar called maltose. So that's why you'll start getting this sweet taste as the chemical goes on. So starch can be converted into maltose through amylase. Okay, and this would be an example of a degradation reaction because starch is a large molecule and it's broken down into, larger, into smaller molecules of maltose. This would be a good example of a degradation reaction to remember starch, amylase, maltose, and I like to try and remember it as SAM, so S-A-M for starch, amylase, maltose. This diagram here shows more of what the reaction looks like. So again, you can see here that starch is a long molecule made of many glucose molecules in a large chain. When amylase, the enzyme is added to it, then this breaks down, so a degradation reaction, into maltose, which you can see are smaller. They're only two glucose molecules long. This can now be absorbed by the gut and used for the cells for energy when you're actually digesting food. The opposite of this is a synthesis reaction. So if you use an enzyme to build up smaller molecules into a larger molecule, this is a synthesis reaction. And an example of this is glucose 1-phosphate, which can be converted into starch, a large molecule, through an enzyme called phosphorylase. So again, this diagram shows you the example of it. Glucose 1-phosphate is lots of individual glucose molecules with phosphate groups attached. If you use phosphorylase, then a synthesis reaction takes place through the enzyme, and this builds up these individual glucose molecules into starch. Okay, so small molecules into a large molecule through an enzyme reaction is a synthesis reaction. No matter what enzyme reaction takes place though, what we like to look at is the conditions where an enzyme works best, and this is called its optimum conditions. So enzymes have both an optimum temperature and an optimum pH, and the optimum is not the same for each enzyme. For example, some enzymes, for example, when we talked at amylase, they work in your mouth. However, some other enzymes will work in your stomach acid. Your stomach acid is a very, very different pH. It's much, much more acidic than the saliva in your mouth. They don't have the same optimum pH range as amylase. So if you look at the graph here, you can see the rate of reaction. This is looking at optimum temperature. And as temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases until it gets to a point where it's at its very peak, at its very best, and this is what we would call its optimum point. So here would be its optimum temperature. And what we're going to look at next is then what happens as it goes past that peak. Once conditions go beyond optimum, then the enzyme denatures. And this is essentially the enzyme starts breaking down. The active site changes its shape, so the substrate can't bind to it anymore. And essentially the enzyme stops working. So as you can see here in the diagram, the temperature is increasing. Uh, as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases up until its optimum point. Once it is past the optimum point, then denaturation takes place, or the enzyme denatures, and it stops working, and the rate of reaction then plummets. So it's important for you to know this process of this curve, whereas, for example, temperature or pH the rate of reaction will increase as the temperature of pH increases towards the optimum point. Once it gets to the optimum point, the enzyme works the best. Once it goes past the optimum point, the enzyme denatures and stops working. 
So this is what you need to know for this key area. Again, it's quite a brief one, but it's commonly asked, and it's important for you to know. So you need to know those five proteins, the share that we talked about. It'd be good for you to know an example of each of those as well. You need to know how enzymes function, the four main points of them, labeling the enzyme, the substrate, know that a substrate has to be specific to an enzyme, and knowing that products are produced by it as well. You also need to know that there's degradation and synthesis reactions and the differences between them, knowing the example of them, and what happens with optimum conditions and denaturation. So there are some uh, examples of questions at the end of this. So hormones are composed of A, glycerol, B, glucose, C, protein, or D, starch. The answer for this would of course be C, protein, as you know that hormones are an example of a protein. In this other example here, it's saying that proteins have different functions. Which of the following statements identifies a protein and its function? So as you work your way through these possible answers, you say hormones carry oxygen around the body. That is false, they do not. Enzymes carry chemical messages around the body. That is false, they do not. Antibodies defend the body against disease. That is true, and it is an example of a protein. With D, cellulose provides strength and structure to a plant cell wall is true, but cellulose is not a protein, it's a carbohydrate. Finally, we're going to look at this question here. It gives you an example of an enzyme called lactase, and it just asks you to explain the role of enzymes in living cells. So that goes back to the four points you need to know. Enzymes are produced in living cells in order to speed up reactions, and that is the key role of enzymes. You need to remember enzymes speed up chemical reactions. They are made of protein, they are specific, they have an optimum temperature, an optimum pH. Once they go beyond that, they denature, and you also need to know the difference between synthesis and degradation reactions. So again, thanks very much for listening, and uh, for those of you who are subscribing to these, I hope you're finding them useful. I will add on the quizzes link as well in the uh, description below this, this video, and we'll get on with part five very soon. Thank you very much.